Free the land. Free the land. Free the land. Shalom for those who have uh, Judea's extraction. Uh, Hokin, uh, all that, all those languages. Uh, I wish you in peace and solidarity. It's important for us to be able to speak in various languages because we are a diverse community, right? A human community, a, a, a human family community, right? And for us to be able to address each other in those languages is a means from which we can communicate with each other with an understanding of who we are as a species on this planet. A species on this planet. And it's important for us to understand that, right? Because we live in a system that has governed us by way of divide and conquer, right? And division, and division, right? They divide us on class and they divide us on race. Class and race. And that's a subject matter that we really have to get into. We have to internalize the understanding that how we got into this world that we're into today. How did this world come into existence, right? And then what can we do to change it? First of all, we got to imagine the idea that we can't change it. That we can't change the circumstances in which we're governed by. The circumstances in which we live by. The circumstances in which we evolve in our own human relationships with one another. But you got to imagine that. Can you imagine a world without white supremacy? What would that look like? What kind of impact would that have on your children and your children's children, right? A world without individualism and competition, right? Individualism and competition, why is that important? Because capitalism, the system of capitalism is based on those two factors, right? If you remove individualism from capitalism, you don't have capitalism. If we remove competition from capitalism, you don't have capitalism, all right? So what is the opposite of individualism and competition? Come on, tell me, what's, it, what's, the, what's the opposite? Solidarity, cooperation, and unity. And that's what we're doing. We're working to build cooperation and unity amongst a diverse group of people. Right? In the Quran, it is taught that for us Muslims, it's taught that God created people in tribes, in different nations, in tribes, not so they hate each other, but so they can get to learn and know each other. Right? That's a process. That's a responsibility. That's a responsibility for each and every one of us to learn and know each other. But now, the problem is that the social order for which you live in was guided by other ideals, other principles. And we need to start with this, the Papal Bull of 1493. That's where it starts. In our day and time, they create the world that we live in today, right? This kind of, this kind of division and murder and killing and annihilation and destroying the human species. Not only destroying the human species, but destroying the planet. They are destroying the planet. And you know what? We are silent for the most part. We are silent. And our silent lends to what? Complicity. To complicity. All right. The Papal Bull of 1863. Oh, excuse me. Of 1493. And you know what happened in 1492, right? It was, it was Columbus. Hmm? <laughs> Come on, say that again. <laughs> say that again. Columbus did what? 
I say of the ocean blue, right? He got to dictate. He understood the dictate, right? And what he did, he conquered and annihilated. That's the reason why we don't have the, the Incas anymore. They're gone, off the planet. The Tianos, gone, off the planet. The Arawak, gone, off the planet. The Cherokees, the Seminoles, the Creek. My great grandma was Creek. All right, Muskogee Creek out of Alabama. All right, the Sioux. Decimated, almost to the point of annihilation. That's the world we have inherited. All right? And so it's important for us to understand that history, right, as this indicates. The Incas, being destroyed by the conquistadores, right? And what does that mean? How did that impact us? It changed the face and the, the contents of the, of the world. And it's the world that we have inherited. Okay. And so for us, it's important for us to know this history, because they're not going to teach you in school, or they're, they're gloss over it. They won't let you know the real impact that it has had on us what has created the world that we live in today, okay? So when we understand this, when we understand this history, this history of genocides, right, then we can understand why it was going on in Gaza today, right? The settler colonial experiments, right? The settler colonial constructs that they committed to. And why does this country support that? This country is based on genocide. This foundation is on genocide. So why would you expect anything other? Why do you expect anything less? Okay? This is the only country that used the atomic bomb twice. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Right? This is a country that used chemical defoliants to wipe out peoples. Or they did in Vietnam with Agent Orange. This is a country that murdered a million people in six months on a lie. A lie. Right? Iraqi war. All right? How we know it's a lie? Because Colin Powell went to the UN and told him, I was told a lie. That they had mass weapons of mass destruction. And they didn't. And they knew it. But they perpetrate that lie on us. How many lies do they perpetrate on us every day? Every day. And we're silent. Right? The greed from which we need to fight back, we're not there yet. There was once upon a time in this country, we got very, very close during the 60s and the 70s. I know because I was part of it. All right? Part of the Black Panther Party. Right. And it was crude into black liberation. Let me give you a little bit of history about myself. All right, I'm going to go back just a little bit. I was asked the question, well, Julia, why do you think the way that you do? You know, what what makes you to be the kind of person that you are? And I tell people, I learned from the feet of my mom. Right? Who was your first teacher? Yes. Your mother. Right? If you're lucky, your father. <laughs> but mostly mother. Right? And my mom, as a young, young age, was a student of African dance. A student of African dance. And she used to teach that to my sister and I when we was growing up. And one thing her instructor told her was that you are African. And that you are of African descent. Right? And that's what she taught me. And my, my, my sister, right? We're Africans. We're not a Negro. We're not a coon. We're not an N-word. We're not a colored person. We're African. Our descendants is Africa. All right? And that was the way I looked at the world. That's the way I perceived the world in terms of my own identity of who I am. All right? We live in a country that is traumatized. We live in trauma. Every day is yet to be resolved. I'm going to talk about that a little bit further as we go on. Okay. And so as a result of my, my own identities, understanding of myself, who I am as a person, I said I carried myself through the world right, growing up. 
I'm African. And as you well know, that this, this system is divided, right? Uh, our social order is divided, right? Through the ideas of some people being superior and other people being inferior. There's that kind of economy, that divide, right, that we are suffering today. Right? Systems is based upon the idea of superiority and inferiority. So growing up, right, I was baptized Catholic. <clears throat> That's ironic, right? Uh, and I had to go to Catholic school. I went to St. Dominic's in San Francisco, born and raised in, o born in Oakland, and, uh, uh, and grew up in Oakland, San Francisco, and San Jose. Went to high school in San Jose for, for a period of time, anyway. And so during the course of the era of Jim Crow, right, black people had to sit in the back of the bus. So y'all wouldn't know nothing about that. All right? Had to sit in the back of the bus. So me, understanding who I am, I decided one day at nine years old, I'm going to sit up front. I want to sit up front with the white people, with white folks. So that's what I did. And the bus driver turned around and said, listen, you know you're supposed to be in the back, go to the back of the bus. And I uh, stood up, looked around, started, and one white woman stood up and said, no, can you sit up here with me? Can you sit up here with me? And I did. And then when she got off on her bus stop, got off on her bus stop, bus driver turned around and said, she's gone, because he didn't have no beef with a, a white woman in, on public bus station. No, nah, that ain't gonna happen, right? He told me, get your black ass in the back of the bus. You know what I did? I stood up, looked around, and see if there was any other person allowed me to sit up front with white people. Look at people in their eyes, look at their faces, right? Nine years old, right? None did. None, not a one. You know what I did? I went to the back of the bus. But that was a lesson for me, crucial lesson for me. Right? What was that lesson? That there are people who are defiant because they understand the morality of the law and know the law is wrong. And they have the wherewithal, the internal, the, the internal strength to stand up and say no. But the majority, go along to get along. They know it's wrong. They know what's happening is wrong. Right? And they are quiet, they are silent about it, they refuse to be defiant. Refuse. That's what we're confronting today. You look at it, we see genocide in our eyes every day when you turn on the TV, genocide. And we're silent. Right? They're desensitizing us. We have been desensitized. This is one more example of that. Why don't you define? In your heart, you know it's wrong. Don't you know it's wrong? Huh? Or do you believe it's right? It's okay to wipe out people, to take their lands, to destroy them. Never history of that in this country. Yes? Okay. Oh, where are we going? Going too far. Right. And so we also have this, right? You saw the Papa Bull, you read it, right? What did it say? anti enslaved the Africans. And that's what they did, all right? Is that humane? Is, is that challenge your conscience, your thought of idea of who you are as a people? This is what they do, all right? So we have, the, this, the Atlantic slave trade, and they brought people to this country. Who are these people? These Africans, the Mandingos, and the Hausa, and the Fulanis, and the Ibus, some Arabs, right? Many other nations on the west coast of Africa and the north coast of Africa. And what happened to them? They messaginated, right? Not only did they messaginate with each other and as a group, right? Because they took away the babies, Trade, trade your babies, uh, 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 um, uh, split families, 
all that. But you also messaged it with who? The Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the English, all those who were involved in the Atlantic slave trade. But you also messaged it with who? The Seminoles, the Creek, the Cherokee. So what they've done, they've created a new Africa. A new African, right? African, but they had the genetic, the DNA, genetic composition of all they had messinated, messengerated. Do you understand what that meant? Right? That means that the African people that has brought to this country can, should be able to speak in all the languages of the world. That's the reason why I opened up my state. All right? Should be able to speak to all the languages of the world, especially the Dutch, the Spanish, the English, and the uh, uh, Portuguese. Suriname, Dutch, Brazil, Portuguese, here, English, uh, uh, Puerto Rico, and other places, uh, 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 Spanish. But we're all one family. But we don't think of our, ourselves as that, as one people on this planet. And so the saga continues. The saga continues. That's too loud. <laughs> okay, okay, I got you. I got you. I got to speak louder. And so we have here, and I'm, I'm, we're going to go through the course of history, right? We're going to do an uh, uh, um, uh, understanding of the situation that brought us to the, what we are today. Okay, I already began the, 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 the foundation, right, of 1493. But then after the, the Civil War, right, part of the Civil War in 1861, right, 1863, right, they had the Emancipation Proclamation. And what does the Emancipation Proclamation tell you, right? That those individuals who have been emancipated, right, have opportunity to live free. Really? Is that what happened? to live free, right? To no longer be slaves, okay? And then after the Emancipation Proclamation, as part of that process, we have what we call Field Order Number 15. Field Order Number 15. It says from St. John River south to the Florida Basin, the territory that was to be emancipated, that the emancipated Africans now comprised or reside Right, was able to establish autonomous governing. They established what they called freedmen bureaus. Freedmen bureaus in this emancipated territory from St. John, St. Rivers, St. John's River, South, South Carolina, to the Florida Basin. Emancipated slaves. Right? Building an autonomous governing process to be liberated. Now, why is it important? That's, why is that important? Because the newly emancipated Africans who were enslaved never had an opportunity to make a choice on what they wanted to do. Whether they wanted to go back to Africa, establish a homeland here, or become part of this experiment that they call the United States, which original name is what? Turtle Island. All right? And so they began to do that. Organize themselves as a governing body, an autonomous governing body here in the United States. Now, let me, let me share something with you about that, right? Understand the United States is comprised of sovereign nations. Do we believe that? Do we understand that? That there are sovereign nations within the, the body, territory, the 3,000 by 2,000 mile territory that we call the United States? Sovereign nations. So this is not something that's beyond your imagination. The possibilities of building sovereign nations within this, this territory. Here they already exist. They may not be able to function fully as sovereign nations because of the system of, of discrimination, of racism, white supremacy, but they do exist. Now our job, our goal, our objective is to ensure their sovereignty and our capacity to live as that. Right? Part of the revolutionary process that we're talking about here today. And so, uh, part of that process, they came up with the 13th Amendment, right? 1868, 1865, rather, right? 13th Amendment. And what does the 13th Amendment read? 
Read it. So what did I tell you? Slave was never abolished in this country. Never. But we've been duped. As their house, Malik Shabazz, Michael will say, we've been hoodwinked. We've been bamboozled. The reality is slavery still exists in the United States. The penal system in the United States is, in fact, a slave system. And they know it. That's why you had to school the prison pipeline. It's deliberate. It's intentional to maintain that system. That's the reason why you have mass incarceration. The same people they brought here to be exploited, the same people they're exploiting in the system of slavery today. Brown, black, indigenous, people of color, majority. You think that's by happenstance? You, know, you think that's a, a, a just... A chance? No, it's designed. It's deliberate. It's intentional. It's purposeful. And we're silent. We're silent. The guys and women that goes into the penal slave system, right? They don't know the law. They don't. But those who are inside, those who run the system, they know the law. They know the case of Ruffin versus Commonwealth that states specifically that prisoners are slaves of the state, black and white. Prisoners are slaves of the state. We are silent. Why are we not fighting against slavery? Why? Shouldn't we be? Huh? Shouldn't we be? Thank you. Okay, we're on the same page on that then. All right. We got to turn the page though. All right. And we turn the page, we have the 14th Amendment. Oops, excuse me. I'm going ahead of myself. We have what they call the Black Codes. Okay. This was the mechanism from which to bring people back into the system of slavery, into the penal slavery system. They created new laws, different laws. So the way they treat African people in America, it's different than the way they treat white people in America, or brown people in America, or indigenous in America, differently. They create new laws, and they allow these laws to perpetuate a system of division. Remember the principles, divide and conquer. Divide and conquer, okay? So they came up with the 14th Amendment, I mean, uh, uh, the Black Codes. And it certain, said, certain states had different ways of implementing the Black Code. Okay. This is laws that continue to they replicate in different ways. All right. I showed it came with the 14th Amendment. What is the 14th Amendment? Due process and naturalization. They asked the question, what are we going to do about these millions of African people who are now uh, no longer slaves? Right? That they said that you as an individual cannot hold another person as personal property. You can't do that. But the state can. The state can. Okay? The ending of chattel slavery and the institution of penal slavery. And it came up with the 14th Amendment. What are we going to do about these Africans? What? Right? They never had opportunity, they never had a plebiscite vote, they never had an opportunity to vote whether or not they want to go back to Africa, establish a homeland here, right, or become part of this experiment. So what they did, they imposed a citizenship, 14th Amendment, imposed it, right? Now, is that a full citizenship? Let me ask you, any woman in here, have you ever been, uh, those who have children, have you ever been halfway pregnant? I mean, come on now. I mean, get this in my head. Let me understand. Has any woman ever been halfway pregnant? I don't think so. So how the hell do we going to have second-class citizenship? Second-class citizenship. Either you're a citizen or you're not. Right? And we know how we've been treated. Black people have been treated in this country. Brown people have been treated in this country. Indigenous people have been treated in this country. 
not as full citizens. Have not and will not. It will not. It won't happen. Right? And the reason why it won't happen because it would change the, the dynamics of how this government runs. It make, make the argument for a more equal and equitable distribution of wealth. That's not going to happen. We're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go on. Right? So then they come back with the 15th Amendment behind that. Now we got these emancipated Africans, right? And there are certain rights that we should be uh, guaranteed, inalienable rights that should be guaranteed, right? One was the right to vote. Okay? And so according to the 15th Amendment, black men was given the opportunity, or unfortunately for white women that was not given that time, at that time, right? But black men was given the right to vote. Were they? Were they actually given the right to vote? If so, then why we had to have the, uh, the voting rights bill of 1964 and 1965? Why was that necessary? They lied. That's what they do. They lie. Okay? The 15th Amendment. And so after the 15th Amendment, right, the supremacists, white supremacists particularly, so they need to do something about this situation, this, this, this empowerment of black people, right, of African people in this country. Right? And what happened was in uh, uh, 1877 with the Hayes-Tillman Compromise, Rutherford B. Hayes won the presidency, or at least the collegiate vote. Samuel Tilden won the popular vote. Now, whew, Samuel Tilden was a confederate. <laughs> what does that say to you? All right? He won the popular vote. And so they had to make a decision as to who's going to win, win what, or who's going to become the president. All right? So they compromised. And then that compromise, he said, okay, Rutherford, you become the president, but in order for us to agree for you to become president, you have to move the Yankee troops from the territory that was emancipated slaves were building their autonomous governing. Remove those troops. Remove them. Right? He agreed. And you know what happened after that? 100 years of lynching. Right? Because the Confederates became who? The Ku Klux Klan. 100 years of lynching. Murderous, savage barbarity to destroy the possibility, the potential of the autonomous new African nation. Destroyed it. That started the first migration out of the south to the north and the west, right? To the east, out of the south. First migration. Keep in mind, though, black people in this country, majority still live in South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana, called the Black Belt South. Majority still live there. That is our traditional homeland in this country, All right? Our traditional homeland, our ancestral homeland, 400 years. Now, let me make, make a point about this 400 years. In 400 years, living in a system of white supremacy, being told that you're inferior, you think we black people have been traumatized? Do you think we're traumatized as a people? Huh? Not only are black people traumatized in this country, white people are traumatized. Let me tell you how white people are traumatized. Because you believe that bullshit. Excuse my language. <laughs> you believe that you're superior to other people of color. And you act that way. You guide your life that way. You make decisions on the basis of that understanding, that aberrant understanding of inferiority and superiority, all right? White skin privilege, huh? Where'd that come from? How do y'all get privilege? I'll tell you how you got privilege. Violence, unmitigated violence, the capacity to engage in violence. That's deep. 
But this is the kind of discussion we need to have across the country. Right? We have to go deep into the, the psyche of this country and understand how we got to the condition that we are in today. Why are we at, why is Jill standing up here? Because if, if those conditions didn't exist, I wouldn't be here. There'd be no need for me to be here. For me to talk. All right? There had been no need for me to spend 49 years in prison in the penal slave system. Let me just segue a little bit on that. Go back to a little history. All right? When I went to prison, I was, I, let me see. I went to the, I joined the Black Panther Party at the age of 16. All right? Let's understand something. The Black Panther Party was a youth movement. A youth movement. There was no one under over the age of 30 in the Black Panther Party. It was in their teens and their 20s. Teens and their 20s in the Black Panther Party. But they were dedicated. They believed in the work that they was doing. They put their life and their liberty on the line for the love of their people. And for the love of humanity. The love of humanity. That was scary for this country. Scary for this country. So I was one of those guys, one of those persons, right? Growing up in high school in San Jose, we started the first black student union. There were no black student studies in those days, right? If you read about, if you, if you study history, you see what happened in San Francisco State as an example, but they fight for black studies, right? All across this country, right? To build black studies. Because they wouldn't teach us black studies, right? Ethnic studies, white supremacy. They taught you how to be adherent to the ideas that they are superior, either directly or subliminally. And so we fought back. We resisted. So at 16, I joined the Black Panther Party. 18, I was recruited into what's called the Black Underground, right at BLA, Black Liberation Army. All right, what was important about that? When Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seals put together the Black Panther Party here in Oakland, right, remember they were students at Laney College, when they established the Black Panther Party, within the dictates of the Black Panther Party, they said that rule number six, that no Black Panther Party member can join any other organization, or underground organization, except for the Black Liberation Army. So they had the insight, they understood that at some point in time, we have to engage in armed struggle. All right? And so they organized the Black Panther Party for the purpose, at, at, at some point in time, to build what was called the Black Underground. The Black Underground existed Black Panther Party came into existence in, 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 in 1966. There was a strike and a, and, and a confrontation in Mexico in 1968, Mexican riot, right? And it's reported by LEAA, that's the Law Enforcement Administration Association, I think that's what they call it, some, some documents that I found doing some of my research. And they found somebody who got murdered in that street demonstration in Mexico had in his pocket a letter with the name on it, BLA, Black Liberation Army. Now, whether the Black Liberation Army was in existence and operating in 1968, I don't know. But the reality is, the situation is that that's a great probability. Because we're developing our relationships with the, with the comrades down in Mexico. Right? Black, brown, unity. Long, long standing. Right? But it's oftentimes it's been distorted throughout our history. And so when I went to prison at 19, right, when they captured me at 19, I knew that I was going behind enemy lines. Right? I understood that I was not a social, com social criminal going into the prison system. That I knew that I was going to be a political prisoner. Right? And as a result of me being a political prisoner, I understood that I would be fighting from behind enemy lines. So we continue to fight. And that's what I did. In San Quentin prison, I started the first national revolutionary newspaper from prisoners called Army Spirit. Merck was there. She helped. Right? And many others. Right? <clears throat> 1977, when I was in San Quentin prison, I started the first petition to the United Nations on the existence of political prisoners and the conditions of prisons in New York State. I mean, in, uh, in this country. The first petition was ever heard and recorded by the United Nations. Continue to fight while you're inside, right? Continue to build a relationship with the people you have on the outside. Right? 
That's important. In 1998, I started the first national organization called the National Jericho Movement in support of political prisoners. Now, I had been fighting for the idea of political prisoners for years before Jericho came into fruition. Okay? I had wrote an, a paper called PPRSM, Political Prison Revolutionary Solidarity Movement. All right, I tried to organize. Uh, it was premature. It didn't happen. But the idea was there, that you need to support your political prisoners. Why? Because they represent the best of us. They are the ones who are willing to put their life and liberty on the line. Everything. If you don't support your political prisoners, you're not supporting yourself. You're not supporting your own movements. You have to support your political prisoners. All right, so if anybody don't know, go to nationaljericalmovement.com and learn about your political prisoners. I'm going to talk about more of them as we, as we continue. Okay. So this is my evolution. Uh, in the prison system. And so, let's go back to this PowerPoint. You see that? Uh, what did that tell you? You know damn well that there was black, brown, and indigenous people storming Congress. There were been black bodies all over the Congressional Plaza. Hmm? Anybody dispute that? They would have mowed down. Why not these people? Why not? Because they're on the same page as this government. They may not like what they did, how they went about it, right? They may not like that, but they did like the fact that they did it. The idea of it. What was the idea? to nullify the black vote. I just told you, Amendment 15, to nullify the black vote. And if you nullify the black vote, what you do? You're nullifying black power. And if you're nullifying black power, what does that mean? You're nullifying black people. Let's understand what's going on here, what we got to look forward towards, what we're looking towards, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's going on across this country. Across this country. Right? Killing the black people, brown people, indigenous people. Some we hear about, majority we do not. Right? State sanctioned murder of our people. All right? Like Michael Brown, like Breonna Taylor, like George Floyd. Majority we don't hear about. Them. Every day, they're killing us in this country, and we're silent. We're silent. We're not organized to fight back, to resist, to resist. We have to. Now, I talked about the, uh, the, the doctrine of discovery, right? Well, did you know this country <clears throat> believes in it? It replicated it. Right? The idea of what they call manifest destiny. Remember that? Were you taught that in school? Manifest destiny, that this country's manifest destiny is to what? Conquer, rule the planet. Manifest destiny. The Monroe Doctrine. Monroe Doctrine just tells you what? It says that the Western Hemisphere, that the United States exceptionalism, American exceptionalism, that they're able to conquer the Western Hemisphere. And they told the other Europeans on the other side, say, don't you come over here. We got this. It's the world we live in. Monroe Doctrine. And that colored guy, oops, uh, um, what's his name? Yeah. That guy. All right? We got issues with that. All right? Because they have assimilated into the system of white supremacy. That's the problem. Dr. Martin Luther King, in 1968, in his uh, speech, The Other America, right before he was murdered. There's two things about that. I'm going to talk about that as, as well. Right before he was murdered, right? 
he did an interview, I think it was CBS News or someone, and he says that he felt that he has ushered his people into a burning building. He started to think, rethink his ideas about integrating into the system of assimilation. Right? Start rethinking the possibilities that perhaps that's not a good thing to do for black folk. Right? Usher these people into a, into a burning building. Right? <clears throat> and so we have to figure out ways how to either put out the fire or build a new building. Okay. Perhaps we need to do both. Now, I want to talk about trauma. In his message to the grassroots, he asked this question. Who taught you to hate yourself? Talk to the young black people. And we see what goes on in our communities today, this kind of internalizing, and this infratricidal murdering that's going on in our community today. Who taught us to hate ourselves? All right? To not have the kind of love and cherish and devotion to each other. Why is this division necessary? Divide and conquer. Right? To keep people in, the, in conditions and where they have not been able to unite. That's what they're scared of. They are afraid of us uniting across the board. They're afraid of us having solidarity, not only here, but around the world. And we're going to talk about that, right, very deeply. Okay. And so, in understanding this history, and I go back again to my own personal experiences, all right? In 2018, I was locked up in Attica Correctional Facility, all right? And I was teaching um, Black Studies, an approved program, Black Studies. <clears throat> and I started in 1861, Emancipation Proclamation, right? I came all the way up to October of 1966. 1966 was the year that the Black Panther Party came into existence. So you cannot talk about black history in this country without talking about the Black Panther Party. You can't. it would be a remiss. Okay. And so I started talking about the Black Panther Party. And you know what they did? They shut the program down. Shut it down. Put me in isolation for four months. For four months. Yeah, lock me down. Four months. For teaching. And you know what they said? They said that I was trying to teach these guys to be militants. <laughs> They're right. <laughs> They're right. They're absolutely correct. Who would I have my class? Bloods, Crips, Gangster Disciples, North Daniels, North Daniels, the gangsters, the gangs, the guys inside the prison system. Yeah, I have an obligation to change their mind, to change their thinking, right? To move them out of the criminal mentality into a revolutionary mentality. Yes, I have a responsibility. That's a goal, right? As soon as I did it, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh, nope, you out of here. Yeah, yeah, you out of here. And they put me in isolation. And when I was isolation, I said, well, listen, I told my comrades, a Jihad Abdu movement, he's the chairman of the National Jericho Movement, right? Uh, right now he's on his way to Tanzania uh, to attend the, uh, the African Press uh, a Peace Conference. And there he was talking about our struggle. He's going to represent our struggle. We are building what we call ambassadors to go around the world and talk about our struggle, what's going on here in this country. We have to do that. We have to tell the world there's a movement here that we are fighting back, that we are resisting. Because the world is waiting on us. And I will share that in a minute, why? <clears throat> so yes, um, so in, 2018, they put me in the uh, special housing unit. I wrote uh, Jihad, and I said, Jihad, we need to bring the international justice back to the United States. 
All right. This will be the second time. We brought them back. We had brought them into the United States in 1978 uh, as a result of the UN campaign to the United Nations that I had initiated. All right. Oh, let me say something about that initiation of that campaign. It was, the inspiration came from a sister by the name of Yuri Kochiyama. Right. If you don't know about Yuri, you should learn about Yuri Kochiyama. Yuri was born here in the United States. Uh, her parents came from Japan. All right. um, and during, civil, during the uh, Second World War, her family was put into concentration camps. She went into concentration camps. Yeah, they put concentration camps. They build concentration camps in this country. They got plans for that. They gonna do it again. At least they're gonna try to. All right? At least that's what I envision. That's what I'm warning us against. All right? That possibility. Okay. And so when she got out of concentration camp, her family moved to Harlem and she became enthralled by El Hash Malik Shabazz. She became a member of the OAAU, his organization. The organization of African American Unity, right? And she also started an organization when the Panthers was being persecuted by the state COINTELPRO, right? Panther 21 case. She joined and organized what we call the National Committee in Defense of Political Prisoners. And then she put out a pamphlet, right, talking about human rights and uh, uh, reiterating the, the arguments and the, uh, the positions that was made by, by El Hajime Shabazz, Malcolm X. Malcolm X said that as long as you keep your struggle within the civil rights movement, as a civil rights movement, within the confines of the domestic nature of this government, that they will control how that movement develops. He said that if you take your movement to the international community, it's no longer a civil rights movement, it's a human rights movement. And that's what we build it, right? Based upon the lesson, the teaching, the dictates, right? Of that house makes a bath. This is a human rights movement. Okay, and so she sent me a pamphlet. I saw the pamphlet. I talked about El Hash Mix I said, "Wow, I can do this, right?" And I took the information. And I wrote a proposal, and I gave it to my next door neighbor, by the name of Rushel McGee, Presente. Right? Oh, <laughs> I was in San Quentin at the Justice Center, the place where they killed uh, where they killed uh, George Jackson, right? Uh, just to give you a little more background, uh, George Jackson was killed on August 21st, 1971. I got captured on August 28th, 1971. It was a lesson. I was trying to retaliate against him being murdered, my comrade being murdered. Our machine gun jammed, <laughs> resulted in my capture. Yeah. That's not history, okay? And so, uh, we had brought the international jurors uh, to the United States in 78, and they discovered and determined that, the per that political prisons does in fact exist in the United States, and they reported that to the United Nations. Okay. Uh, as part of that process, and, um, and the international jurors, they had visited, I think, uh, Sunni Adekoli, who is now home, uh, Leonard Peltier, who is still fighting to be released. I think uh, a couple of people, I mean, Susan Rosenberg, someone else, I, I can't remember which one, right? And they determined that political prisons exist in the United States. Why is that important? Because the United States is in, is in denial, right? Denial that they have political prisons, because to, to, to admit they have political prisons is to admit that they got dissent in this country. They're not going to do that. Because they tell the world that the United States is, is, is uh, the streets are paved with gold. You know what I mean? This is the place where you want to come. Okay. <laughs> well, you know the problem with that. They're coming. All right? But they're not coming because, because the streets are paid and gold. They're coming because they have exploited their countries. Right? Exploited, colonized their countries. Making it almost impossible for them to survive and live in their countries. So what they do, they come here. Right? That's it's logical. It's logical, because this is the country that extracted the resources from their country. There's 744 billionaires in the United States. I got so much to talk about, so I'm going to be back and forth, right? But I hope you guys will be able to 
you know, tied together, you know, string it like beads, you know, for a necklace or something, I don't know. String it like beads, okay. 744 billionaires in the United States. With the cumulative wealth of nearly $7 trillion. All the wealth of Western Europe. All the wealth of Western Europe. And the 744 individuals and corporations of the United States. Okay. And a population of 330 million people. 330 million people. We don't live in a democracy, right? That's another lie they told us, right? And that we can see to. It's not a democracy. It's a plutocracy. The rich rules. That's what a plutocracy is. So when you go out to vote, right? Who you vote for? You either vote for another millionaire or one person who won't be a millionaire. All right? For exploiting the people. Okay, so the international Jewish reported to the United, to the United Nations and other international bodies that proves exist in the United States. So in 2018, I asked for them to be returned, to come back. So I gave the information. I said, listen, on Jihad, we need to bring the international Jewish back. I'm locked up in solitary confinement. I'm getting tired. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go home. All right, let's see if we get the international Jewish to come back. He said, okay, Jilo, we're going to do that. We're going to bring them back. He brought it to the attention of uh, my dear beloved comrade Presente Seko Odinga. Right? Let me just segue Seko Odinga just for a minute. <sighs> Say, <laughs> my powerful. We got heroes, we got walking heroes that we don't even know about. Right? Seku uh, joined the Black Panther Party, was instrumental in establishing the Black Panther Party in, in Harlem, in, uh, in Queens. Right? In the Panther 21 case, they went to arrest him, right? He barricaded his door, climbed out the back window, scaled down two stories, right, on a water pipe, right? When the SWAT team was coming in the front, he was going out the back. And he left, right? Got away. We call him our Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. Got away and went to Algiers and helped set up the uh, international the international um, uh, chapter of the Black Panther Party in Algiers, right? He sat with Yasser Arafat, right? He trained with the PLO. You see what I'm saying? The kind of relationships that we've had with people around the world, building these kind of relationships, right? And then after he trained with the PLO and the situation came to a point where they had to close down the, uh, the international section of the Black Panther Party because of the split based on COINTELPRO, we can talk about that, maybe, if we got time, right? <clears throat> he came back. And then we did, got back in the movement. Organized in the movement. And was instrumental in ensuring that Asada Shakur is in Cuba today. That's a revolutionary, right? Help her escape. Organize for her being escaped and get to Cuba with a $2 million bounty on her head today. We can talk about that too. All right, that's Seku Odinga. So we brought the attention to Seku. Seku did 33 years, finally got out, back in the movement. All right, you saw a picture of him uh, leading the prayer for the uh, introduction of the International Tribunal. All right, <clears throat> he just passed a couple of months ago, a month and a half ago. And so they said, okay, Gino, we're gonna bring them back, but this time we're gonna raise the issues of genocides. The question of genocides. We brought five charges to the International Tribunal. The five charges of mass incarceration, health inequities, environmental racism, police murdering of our people, state sanctioned murder, right, and political prisoners. All right, that was on October 22nd, uh, 1920, uh, 2021, right? And on October 25th, 2021, the International Jewish found the United States guilty of the charge of genocides against black, brown, and indigenous peoples. Guilty, the charge of genocides, black, brown, and indigenous people. Now, let me just share something about 
the issue of genocide. So we, do, we hear this word being passed around, thrown around, and so forth, but oftentimes we don't know what it really means. In my book, We Are Own Liberators, right? Right? We are our own. We are our own. We are our own. Everybody gonna do it if we don't. If we don't, it ain't gonna get done. It's not. The 1948 Convention on Genocide states the following. In the present convention, genocides mean any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part the national, ethnic, religious, racial group such as one, killing members of the group. Are they killing us? Killing members of the group, right? Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Traumatized. Creating trauma in the group. Mental harm, right? Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of calculated uh, to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. So that means that they don't have to just wipe you out like they did uh, in the Holocaust, right? It could be a slow decimation, what they're going on in Gaza, or what happened to the Cherokees, or, or to Sue, right? Uh, Lenny Peltier, remember, remember his name. I have to speak his name, I have to share his name, okay? For a crime that he know, they know he did not commit. I'm gonna talk about these political prisons more, okay? Yeah. In whole or in part. Imposing measures tend to prevent births within the group. Sterilizing our women without their consent. There's a case in, I think, in Chichala, uh, 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 uh prison here in, in, this, in, this, in, in California where the women were suing because they were being sterilized without their consent, unknowingly being sterilized. 30 years ago, there was a big Confrontation in Puerto Rico. Sterilizing women without their consent. Decimating their capacity to populate, to reproduce, and forcibly transferring children of a group to another group. And we know they did that with the indigenous. Right? We know they did that with the indigenous. Took them away from their tribes, from their families, gave them to missionaries, cut their hair, changed their names, and took away their culture. Destroying them. Right? The very fabric of the indigenous is their culture. And they removed them from that. All right? And it also says here, right, in Article uh, 3, that the following shall be punishable. Genocides can be punishable. Right? Conspiracy to commit genocide. Conspiracy. Direct or public incitement to commit genocides. Attempt to commit genocides. And complicity in genocide. It's punishable. Okay? According to 18 U.S.C. 1091, Google it. Right? It's the United States Treaty to the, to the Convention. It's signature to the convention, right? It's law in the United States. The same thing I just read, read it. You think the United States is going to charge yourself with genocide? <laughs> Never going to happen. It's not. We have to do it. We have to do it. Charge them with genocide. Okay. And that's what we're going to do, right? As a result of the decision made by the international jurors finding the United States guilty of the charge of genocide against black, brown, and indigenous people, we are going to build alternative systems of governing. Why? Because we've got to remove ourselves from harm. They're killing us. If you go statistically, Google it, right? The growth rate for black people in this country is almost near stagnant. All other ethnic groups are growing in this country. Not black people. Not in proportionally to their population. Not black people. 
Mass incarceration is genocide. International jurist says so. We agree. Why? Because you're putting people in prison at an early age. The 1994, 1994 uh, uh, Bill Clinton's uh, uh, um, bill said they put 13 years old to be sent to prison, go prison. Who was that for? Not for white kids. Who was that for? And you're putting people in prison 10, 20, 30, 40 years at the time when they're most able to produce, reproduce. Millions gone. Not reproducing. Not making babies. Decimating the population. Preventing reproduction. It's deliberate. It's intentional. They know what they're doing. Chemical warfare in our communities. Right? The drug trade. That's chemical warfare. You see some of these people out here walking around like zombies. Chemical warfare. Right? And who's bringing, the, who's bringing these drugs in? Who? I heard somebody say, what did it say? CIA. How we know? How we know? Huh? What's his name? Highway Rick? Right? They made a movie about it? They, made, <laughs> they had the gall to make a movie about it. Huh? The Iron Country Gate? Why didn't you make a movie about it? Because they know you're not going to do anything. All right? You're going to spend the money to watch the movie. More money, more money, more money. Off your misery. Right? Yeah, that's what they do. That brought the drugs in our community to decimate. And nobody did it because of the militancy of the black movement, black power movement during the 60s and the 70s. And you call and tell people to destroy the movement, and then what they did? They saturated the community with drugs. Wiped out two generations, at least two generations, gone. Yeah. Deliberate, intentional, purposeful policy. Population control. All right? So what we're going to do, we're going to be able to call the people Senate. It's time for us to remove ourselves from harm. Recognize the reality of the situation that they're not going to change. In fact, if Trump becomes to get back in office again, you guys better be ready. Be prepared. Be prepared. All right? There's once a civil war in this country, and it was based upon what? African people. It's going to be the second, second civil war in this country. What's it's going to be about? African people. What to do about the people of color in this country. They want to maintain the system of white supremacy. And we are waking up. What they call being woke? <laughs> yeah. Are you woke? If you ain't woke, then you sleep. All right? So I'm kicking your ass and making you wake up. All right? It's important because we are suffering from the ostrich syndrome. What's the ostrich syndrome? Our hair stuck in the air and our ass stuck in the air. Our, air, our hair stuck in the ground. Our ass stuck in the air so they get kicked again. And I refuse. I'm not going to be a slave. I'm not going to be a slave. No. Right? If I got to have the job, I'm going to work in the school where I can teach. Right? GED, so forth and so on. Or I'm going to work in the yard right, where I can uh, get my exercise on. Okay. I've been a little remiss lately, but I got to get back to it. <laughs> okay. Get my exercise on. All right? And so... <clears throat> The international jurors found the United States guilty of genocides. Keep this in mind. If an international tribunal had found China guilty of genocides against the Uyghurs, right, the Muslims in China, been all over the news, been all over the world. China been found in guards genocides. Not here. The corporate media will not talk about it. They will not inform you that an esteemed body of international jurists found the United States guilty of the charge of genocide against black, brown, and indigenous people. All right. So we have to do it. So that's why we're making this, this, this tour, or this speaking tour. This is the reason why jihad is in Tanzania, right? Uh, South Africa, and the other places we're going to, spreading the world, spreading the word.
Two years ago, I was in Venezuela, right? Went to an international conference of uh, political prisoners, right? And I went to uh, uh, Greece, right? Excuse me. I went to Greece for the international uh, international post of political prisoners. I went to Venezuela on the issues of a brother by the name of Alex Saba, Alex Saab, who was kidnapped uh, by the United States government, a uh, representative of Venezuela government. And we'll talk about that if you want uh, at some point in time. Right? And we got, he's now out, he's home. Right? So they asked me to come there to represent or to learn about his story. I come back here and I start talking about it. And um, we built supportive campaigns, and he's home now. All right. But I told them, when I went to Venezuela, when I went to Greece, you will not be free until black people are free. Tell them the world. Tell the world. You will not be free until black people are free. Why? Because we live in a system that's based upon the ideas of white supremacy. Right? Idea of white supremacy. Look anywhere in the world. Okay, where you go? Venezuela, uh, uh, not Venezuela. Ven yeah, he was from Venezuela, right? On a different level. But you go to New Zealand, go to Australia, go to Germany, go to Italy, go to Britain, go to France, go to Brazil, go to Caribbeans, go to Africa. You find that black people are downtrodden. No matter where you go, all over the world, all over the planet. Black people are downtrodden. They live in ghettos and, and slums and, and conditions that's worse than you know, we have here in this country, many of them. Downtrodden. Because we live in a world that's based upon the idea of superiority and inferiority. Right? And black people are found to be inferior based upon this idea, this aberrant idea of psych psychology of white supremacy. Why did I say it's aberrant? There's a book called DSM, right? Diagnostic Statistical Manual, right? It is the Bible of psychiatry and psychology. In that book, it states that superiority complex is a mental disorder, a God complex. You got to run around here talking about he God, so forth, so on. What are you going to say? He said he's crazy, right? He said there's something wrong with him. He has a mental disorder. So what does that say about white supremacy? What does it say? It's not my words, it's their words. It's your words. Connect the dots. Y'all crazy, white folks. You're out your mind. If you think you're superior to any other people on this planet, there's something wrong with you. You got a God complex. That's your trauma. Right? I remember a story about El Haas Malik Shabazz when he, uh, uh, in his autobiography, I read that he gave a presentation in Philadelphia University. Right? And after the presentation, he was walked out, he was leaving, right? And a white girl came up to him, a white woman, young white woman, went up to him and said, listen, what can I do? I heard your message, what can I do? He looked at him, turned and said, nothing, and walked away. Years later, as he grew and understood, matured, he recognized that he made a mistake. That was an error. Right? And what he should have told them, you go to your families, you go to your community, you go to your people, and you fight against white supremacy. You go tell them, Uncle Bubba and Aunt Jane, right, drop down that, man, that Confederate flag. That's your responsibility. I can't go to the white community and tell you to stop being racist. I can't do it. Right? But you can. That's your obligation. That's your responsibility. Okay. That's your level of humanity, if you have it. Okay. So we build with all the people sitting across the country. See some pamphlets over there? Please pick up one, learn about it. Go to the spiritofmandela.org, right? spiritofmandela.org slash over to people sitting and register. Become part of this campaign. Right? We are creating a new world, people. We have to. This world is destructive. All right? 744 billion, 740 uh, 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 billionaires in this country. 333 million people, right? And we're complicit in our own oppression. We find it off the crumbs off their table, right? Find it off the crumbs of their table. They just sent $18 billion to Israel, 
onto Palestine, onto the Zionists. $18 billion. Can you imagine what we can do with $18 billion in our community? Can you imagine? But we're silent. The young people on these campuses across the country, I salute them because they're resisting. All right? It reminds me of when we used to resist when I was a young kid. Okay? But they will kill you. They got to be prepared for that. They'll put you in prison, lock you away. You gotta be prepared for that. Because they wanna maintain the system as it is. Kent State, Orange State, learn the history. Bring out the National Guards. The police, we don't have no, listen. The police, the, the, uh, the friendly neighborhood cop. Yeah, right. Right? These are agents of the state. They will protect property over people. Property over people. That's their job. Right? The history comes from the slave patrols. Police. That's their history. Slave patrol. And they function in that capacity today to ensure that black people, brown people, are contained in their communities. So they don't have to disturb white folks' stuff and what they're doing. Right? Except for when they put us to work so they can absorb the profits for my labor. Wage labor, wage slavery. That's the system we live in, capitalism, right? Now, there is a recent proposal made by this guy. Now, I got to do some more research on him. His name is um, Sean Fain. He's the president of UAW, right? United Auto Workers. And he's proposing in 2028 to lock this country down, a general strike. A general strike across this country. I don't know all the dynamics of what he's proposing. I have to do some more research. But it's an excellent idea. And this is how he's planning on doing it. He's trying to get all the units to ensure that their contracts are being negotiated around about the same time. Smart, brilliant idea. Right? Negotiated around about the same time. And if they negotiate around about the same time, they can all go on strike around about the same time. All right? Lock this country down. Now, we have to make sure that when they lock the country down, what they're being negotiated is issues that is important to us. All right? That they don't compromise and they don't uh, um, retract all right? from the goals and objectives and ensuring that there's more equitable distribution of wealth in this country. Now, last thing, before we go to question and answers, all right? 13 forward. Oh, it's a couple more things. 13 forward. That's the campaign to end mass incarceration, to end penal slavery. If you're not worried about it, go check it out, please. Get involved and support the campaign 13 forward. We are moving to end penal slavery in this country. And to end penal slavery is to end mass incarceration because you remove the incentive, the profit-making motivation for mass incarceration. All right? So it's very important that we do this. We, we have to get organized. This is one way that we can do so, mass incarceration. And what happens is that those inside, right, the incarcerated, <clears throat> yes, we want, to, we want to end the whole system of, of incarceration, period, in the penal system. But it has to be a process. We have to raise our level of consciousness and our determination. We have to get organized in our community to ensure that money, finances, is distributed more equally so we don't have to engage in criminal activities. Right? Do we agree that poverty is the, the progenitor for criminal behavior? Hmm? We don't have high crimes in affluent communities. Why? They have the resources. Right? So why do why, why we have high crime in black, brown, and, and indigenous communities? No resources. That's the reality. How money is being allocated. How finance is being used in this country. Who is appropriating the wealth to the detriment of the, the, the few appropriating wealth to the detriment of the many? Right? And how to keep it that way? Divide and conquer. 
right? Class divisions, racial division in this country. They keep us divided at each other's throat. And they continue to create conditions from which they can do their dastardly deeds around the world. Like what's going on in Palestine today. All right? And so, 1340 is extremely important. Uh, we end mass incarceration. We have our people on the inside began to get um, full compensation for their labor, to be compensated for their labor. And what happens, you change their, when you change their ideas of who they are, their value, right? Become incarcerated workers. We associate, associate that with the unions. When they come home, they get a union job, right? Although it seems like you're sustaining the system of capitalism, but you're also ensuring that there's money going back into our communities. When they remove a person out of our community and send them in the penitentiary, you're, using, you're, you're removing our, our, our income from that family, from that community. You're keeping that community impoverished. All right? The welfare system will operate in that same capacity, where they tell the mothers that if you've got a man in the house, you can't get the welfare. Right? That's just joint families. Right? And economic incentives. The way they do so, divide and conquer. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> this is the last thing that is important that we understand. Extremely important that we understand what they're planning. Cop cities across this country. Cop cities across this country. Right? For what purpose? They're training law enforcement to what? Urban warfare. They're training law enforcement in urban warfare. Urban warfare against who? Us. Us. Right? You know how, you know how significant that is? What they're planning? They're planning to lock down this country. That's their plans, okay? And in doing so, keep this in mind, right? If they have the vision of the necessity to train law enforcement in urban warfare, recognizing at some point in time there's gonna be resistance, rising of resistance in our communities, then why don't they mitigate against that? Why don't they not have to train law enforcement in urban warfare Recognize that it's going to be a problem in these communities and address the problems in the communities. So they don't have to do this training. Because they ain't going to do that. Hell to them, no. You know why? Because it means reallocating funds, redistribution of wealth. They're not going to do that. That's not the way the system works. That's not the way the 744 billionaires want this country to work. All right? Cop cities. Get prepared, people. It is serious. It is serious. It is serious. That's not like them. So I went from 1492 to 1966 to where we are today in 2024, all right? I said a lot, I try to capsulize it, all right? I'm not the best of a uh, public speaker. I'm getting better. Uh, thank you for you all. All right, is there any questions? And we'll ask to keep it at questions. No, no comments and spiels. Questions? <laughs> yes, sis. Certain people, when they get arrested, then 
they, you know, we have to bail them out. Mm -hmm. That bail money goes to the city, then that diverts funds away from like other movements and you wonder like, is there, are there times when it's like more useful to get arrested for certain things that's like more, <laughs> like I, you know, these are just the types of things I wonder about in terms of, you know, what's, what's the most powerful mm -hmm. way to mm -hmm. really make Okay, all right. You run the risk of being arrested if you can rebel, period. Right? Or being murdered, being killed, if you rebel. That's the way the system works, right? They're going to prevent any type of dissent to their order, right? Um, their order is our chaos, okay? It's our disruption, it's our disorder, right? If you're not prepared to make those kind of sacrifices, you should be in the game. All right? There's no ways, no other ways to look at it, okay? Um, uh, so and that means that you have to get organized, okay? I was telling some uh, people, uh, the young people uh, the other day down in uh, San Diego, I think it was, right? And I told them, I said, listen, in order for you guys to get organized the way you need to be organized, you got to get out to the community. You got to organize the community. When the Black Panther Party was being vamped on, you know who came to the aid of Black Panther Party? The community. The community. Why? Because we were providing services to the community. Services that the government was not providing. The People's Program. Providing the service to the community. And the community supports the People's Program. When they vamp on the, pro on the program, hopefully they never will, but if they should, the people should be out there to support them. Okay. So get organized. Right? Extend what I call consensual circles. You have one circle, bigger circle, bigger circle. That's how we grow in our evolution, in our development. I'm a revolutionary. I proudly announce myself as being a revolutionary. Okay? You all should be revolutionary. Why? If you take the R off revolutionary, what word do you have? Evolutionary. On a species of, uh, on this planet, we all do what? We evolve. We evolve from one state of development to another state of development, to hopefully a higher state of development, right? From Cro Magnum to Homo sapiens sapiens. That's evolutionary process. Okay, and so we should be engaged in the process of evolving from one state of development, social order, to another state and higher state of development, social order. Okay, that should be our process. That should be our thinking. And sometimes you have to put the R back on the evolutionary process. As a species on this planet, we should be always seeking to evolve, to grow, to become more humane. Right? And so sometimes we have to put the R back on. Why? Because the system that we have sometimes becomes calcified. Right? It becomes stuck. They don't want to change. So sometimes we have to move them into the dustbin of history. We got to usher them into the dustbin of history, right? And that's revolution. The revolutionary process is evolutionary process. This is how we, as a social order, evolve from one state of development to another state of development. We all should be revolutionaries. Not only that, we all should be abolitionists. We should abolish the penal slave system. Frederick Douglass, the city where I live in Rochester, Right, one of the greatest abolitionists that we know, right, being about. So you read his works, it's fantastic stuff, right? Be abolitionists. But let's expand that word, because abolition means to exterminate, right? To abolish, to terminate. So I'm asking you, anything and everything that dehumanizes, degrades, devalues black people, abolish it. Abolish it. If you see that it does that, Dehumanizes, degrades, devalues black people, abolish it. Let's expand the word, expand the understanding of what being an abolitionist means. Why is that important? Keep this in mind. 1968, when Martin Luther King went to Memphis, Tennessee, right, right before he got murdered, he went there for what? To support the sanitation workers. Strike. Is that correct? Right? And the sanitation workers. As they was picketing and marching, they wore a body placard, a full body placard. Do you remember what it said? I am a man. What? Why 
Why would they have to wear a full body black card and say, I am a man? Because of the degree that they have been dehumanized and devalued as a human being in this system. 40 years later, hashtag what? Huh? Black Lives Matter. What changed? 40 years later, Black Lives Matter. Who didn't know Black Lives Matter? Who didn't know that? The system creates conditions that devalues, dehumanizes, and degrades human beings so they can be exploited or super exploited. All right? So we're going to build a people's center. We're going to move ourselves from this system. This system got to go. It's done. Right? Let me say something else about that. Right? We live in an empire. Do you know this is an empire? This is an imperialist empire? And history tells us that empires do not die from external forces. They don't. They don't. The United States is like an octopus. Right? It has its tentacles all around the world, sucking up the resources, sucking up the human labor from all around the world. Right? And every once in a while, there's a revolution in different countries, right? And they remove themselves, that tentacle, from being colonized or neo-colonized. Remove themselves, right? Cut off that tentacle. And what happens? In time, it grows back. Why does it grow back? Because no one had dealt with the head of the empire. The head of the empire. And that's us. Right? We are the one who has to deal with the head of the empire. Right? Empires are destroyed by internal forces. When the people inside the empire says, no more, we're done, finish. Can't take it no more. Right? Empires are destroyed from internal forces. That's us. And the world is waiting on you. The world is waiting on you. All around the world. They're waiting on the people inside this empire to say no more, to free the world of a system of exploitation and superiority complexes, of systems of superiority and the divisions. We have a daunting task before us, a daunting task. Right? We have to get on it. The people are dying all around the world. This is the only, as I made mention, this is the only country that uses the atomic bomb. Chemical defoliants, right? Mass murder, carpet bombing, right? And also chemical warfare on its own people. Concentration camps, mass incarceration, right? Killing our people with impunity, state sanctioned violence. And they get mad when we say, I'm tired, right? I'm fighting back. All right. We have an obligation. We have an obligation to ourselves and to our children. All right. I'm standing on the shoulders of the ancestors that came before me. All right. I know that. Okay. My mom taught me that. All right. And I'm going to honor that. All right. To my last breath. All right. We're going to fight. All power to the people. That's right. And we are our own liberators. Any more questions? Brother, you had a question over here? If you have a question, come up front and ask the mic so everybody can hear you. You got a question? Yeah. Come on, brother, ask the question, man. Declaring us as, he said, declaring us as, as United States citizens take away our, 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 our sovereignty as a people, right? The question that I answer is based upon the reality of how we are being treated. Are we, in fact, citizens, full citizens of the United States? If so, why didn't white folks do what they did on January 6th, right, to nullify the black vote, right? Why is it that we have, uh, after the 15th Amendment, you have uh, 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 voting rights law of uh, 1964 and 1965, right? 
to argue for that we need to be full citizens. We never have been full citizens of the United States. But let me say this here, Declaration of Human Rights. Let me find this, if I can, right quick. The Declaration of Human Rights says this. Everyone has a right to a nationality, right? And no one shall be arbitrarily or deprived of his nationality or denied the right to change his nationality, okay? We have an inalienable right to establish our own nation, right? To establish our own nation, to become sovereigns. We have sovereign nations here in the United States right now in this Turtle Island, right? But they're not able to uh, manifest Right? fully implement their sovereignty because of the system of white supremacy, the system of capitalist exploitation. All right? So in as much as the 14th Amendment says that you're a citizen, they impose that upon you, right? In practice, that's not the reality. Right? We don't have the full rights, all the rights that's guaranteed to other peoples, particularly white folks in this country. Right? When you go get a loan, a bank loan, right? What you got to go through, my people ain't got to go through the same circumstances. They got to jump through them same hoops. Okay? Redlining, that's deliberate. To make sure that our population of people stays. Right now in, out in um, Mississippi, Mississippi right now, they have established a law for an enclave of white people, their own police force, right? A, a, a daily community, a number of white people, right? They established that as a policy in Mississippi. Right, to ensure that black folks stay away from them. Right. And it's going to evolve that. That's, that's, that's what will grow. That's what will develop even further. Right. If you look at the social sciences and what's going on in this country, particularly, especially if Trump gets back in. Right. Not to say that you know, Trump is any <laughs> kinder or gentler than Biden. Right. I got a problem with electoral votes. Whether you vote for the party of the Democratic or Republican, you still vote for the party of genocides. Huh? You vote for the party of genocide. And that's not only externally, but also internally. Internally into the empire. So um, if you believe that you're a citizen of the United States, more power to you. Get all that you can, you know, why you can, for as long as you can. All right. Me? No. We got to change this. We got to move to We got to create alternative systems of governing. Right? And no one can do it better than us. People are the motive force in creating history. People are the motive force in creating history. We have to create history. It was, what, 13, 12 people that created this country? The founding fathers? Right? This 200 something years of experiment of genocide and enslavement for the benefit of the elite class, right? Particularly people of absent of color. <laughs> right? This kind of conversation we have to have in this country. We have to be open to this kind of conversation. Right? Critical race theory. Why do they oppose it? Because it's truth telling. It's the narrative of truth. What really happened in this country? They didn't want their children to know how barbaric and savage they had been. You saw that picture of uh, 100 years of lynching. You see them looking at the, the murdering somebody with glee in their face. Right? You saw what happened in, in, in uh, what was it, South Carolina, North Carolina, the, the uh, uh, ticky, ticky tack, the ticky talk uh, parade. Huh? When they're carrying those torches. Yeah, Virginia. Right? What are they saying? You will not replace us. Right? They're serious. Maintaining the system of white supremacy. And they're armed. They just went for the go ahead. What happened in January 6th was a prelude. Right? Let's not deceive ourselves. The reality of the situation. It is dire. It's dire. The empire is being challenged all around the world. 
And when the empire sounds around the world, what do they do? They get inside and try to maintain their, their, their capacity to profit. Super exploitation of one people. And then if, you're not, if they feel that you're unvalued, they're going to put you in prison and work you in prison in the penal slave system. So they continue to make money off our labor. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, brother. Wa alaikum wa sallam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I just wanted to ask, um, you know, since October 7th, we've seen a heroic movement of Islamic resistance for decolonization in West Asia. What can those of us organizing in the head of the octopus learn from those movements and in that part of the world? Can you give me a more specific example? Um, the resistance of the Palestinian resistance in Gaza, uh, the PIJ, Hamas, Hezbollah in South Lebanon, um, the forces in Iraq. Um, fighting the Zionist entity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, solidarity. Build solidarity uh, with those movements. Okay. Extremely important. Recognize who they are, what they're fighting for, right? And talk about it. Right. In the Islam, we are told, <clears throat> for those of you who are non Muslims, but for Muslims, right, we are told we have an obligation. To fight tumult and oppression wherever we may find it. The tumult and oppression is worse than slaughter. Right? Not only that, we are told that in terms of fighting that tumult and oppression, our first way of doing so is with what? The ad. Our hands. Right? Our second way of fighting against it is lesan, our tongue. And our third way of fighting is in the cult, in our heart, which is the wickedest form, to harbor it in our heart. Right? So we have an obligation to engage, to engage. That's a dictate, all right? Or we're not doing it. They know that, those Muslims are fighting back. We're still, we're still fighting the Crusades, bro, from 1492, 1493. It's still the Crusades, OK? Well, let me say something about that. I don't care what religion you are, if you have a religion, right? Whether you're Christian, Jew, uh, um, Hindu, Buddhist, uh, Protestant, oh, that's Christian, right? Uh, whether domination, right? Whatever it is, all religions teach you that hoarding wealth is what? A sin. Hoarding wealth is a sin. Why? Because you're hoarding the wealth to the detriment of the many. Jesus, Esau, right? What did he do? He kicked over the the money changes table. He was a revolutionary. Oh, you didn't know that? Yeah, yeah, Jesus was a revolutionary. Okay. Muhammad was a revolutionary. Right? All the prophets of old, right, as they been mystified into these, you know, this historical narrative, right? They fought against the system. They bring new truth, new realities to the world. That's what they were doing. And they got resistance. Right? They fought back. Many were killed. Betrayed. Judas. Right? You saw the, uh, the movie Judas and the Messiah? Y'all see that? Right? <laughs> Our dear comment, uh, I don't know why they use that name. Right? But it was reflecting of, a, of an understanding. Uh, the Messiah. Let me talk about that for a minute. Right? Cointel Pro. See, y'all get me started to ask this question. I just go all over the place. I try, try, I try to stop, but it's just so much need to be said. Counterintelligence program, right? What was it about? To prevent the rise, one of the reasons, prevent the rise of Messiah. But let's talk about that. All right, counterintelligence program. This is a February uh, 29, 1968 by FBI, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, dated called LHM, was letterhead memorandum that he sent to all the, 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 the bureaus across the country, right, COINTELPRO, right, counterintelligence program. One, to prevent the coalition of the militant black nationalist groups, an effective coalition of black nationalist groups might be the first step towards a real Mau Mau in America, beginning a true black revolution. Did anybody know what the Mau Mau's were? All right, who were the Mau Mau? Kenya, that's right, revolutionaries that fought against the British and won. Cut off one of those tentacles, right, and put the first president, uh, African president, uh, Komo Giana, uh, Kenyatta, into office. They want to prevent that from happening, 
right? A real Mau Mau. I don't know what their name, but a revolution, okay? Prevent the rise of a messiah who could electrify and unify the militant black nationalist movement. Malcolm X may have been a messiah. He is a martyr of the movement today. We also said the same thing about Dr. Martin Luther King, that if he had changed his mind from being a, a peaceful integrationist, that he might have been that. That's the reason, one of the reasons why they murdered him at the time that they did, because he was changing his mind. Right? He was becoming more militant. He was to recognize that this imperialist entity, this construct, does not work in the best interest of our common humanity. But not only that, in terms of the Messiah, J. Edgar Hoover, in the 1920s, was an agent of the FBI. He was not the director, he was the agent. And one of his targets at that time was Messiah, Marcus Messiah Garvey. Marcus Garvey. And Marcus Garvey, at that time, was one of the greatest organizers in our contemporary, black organizers in our contemporary time. Right? He had organized here in this country, he organized in Latin America, he organized in the Caribbean, he organized in Africa, he organized in England. And they set him up, tax evasion, put an agent into his organization, right? had him exiled. Right? And J. Edgar Hoover recognized that potential. So in 1968, right, he says to prevent the rise of a Messiah from the experience of dealing with Marcus Garvey. It's a long trajectory of repression. Three, prevent violence on the part of black nationalist groups. Through counterintelligence, it should be possible to pinpoint potential troublemakers and neutralize them before they exercise their potential for violence. Do you understand what the word neutralize mean? To destroy, to terminate, to kill, to neutralize them. Before what? Before they even have the potential to engage in violence. Neutralize you with the idea that you might engage in violence. They will kill you. All right? It is designed that way. Right. Before you even gave in an act. Who they did that to? Give me somebody. Any one person. Someone. Fred Hampton. Thank you, bro. Yeah, Fred Hampton. Murdered him. And not engaged in any violence. He's the one who created the idea of the Rainbow Coalition. Bring the Patriot Party and the Young Lords and the Black Panther Party. The Patriot Party was Appalachian white people who was tired of living in the conditions they were living. And they linked up with the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords, creating a coalition of resistance. Right before Jesse Jackson took it and after he was murdered, turned it into something else. Right? Rainbow Coalition. That's what we're talking about today. Same thing. Right? 21 years old. Right? Fred Hampton. Prevent military black nationalist groups and leaders from gaining respectability by discrediting them to the separate segments of the community. All right? Discrediting them. Saying that they're not viable, feasible, that they're not true to their word. All right? Turning them to liars. All right? That's what they did during the, during the course of the Black Panther Party. All right? Creating dissension within the organization. Right? Preventing them to have relationships with other people. At the time, we had relations with Marlon Brando and the other kinds of folks like that, right? who understood what was going on at the time and were supported. And then what they did, they sent poison pen letters right? to an organization and to others to prevent them from gaining respectability or support in our communities. Right? A final goal should be to prevent the long range growth of militant black nationalist groups especially the youth, right? They don't want you to grow. They want the youth to be organized, to be informed. Right? There's also a man around the world that says that any youth that succumbs to revolutionary teachings will be dead revolutionaries. If you succumb to the teachings, you'll be dead revolutionaries. They don't want them to press that kind of terror in our community. A couple of months ago, they, I, I read that they killed a young, young man shot him 60 times, 
60 times, right? Uh, I, think, I think it was uh, a guy in Chicago that shot at him 100 times. I can't remember his name. 100 times. Only takes one bullet to kill a person. But they did this to Swiss, they Swiss cheese these individuals to create terror in your community. It wasn't just for that one person or that one family. It's for the community. They tell the community, this is what we'll do to you with impunity. Get away with it. Huh? Cop City? If they could do that now, imagine when they start training these guys in urban warfare. This is serious. This is serious. They are organized and getting prepared. And we're not. We're not. And that's for me, that's scary. And that's scary for me, right? It's scary for my babies, my, my great kids, my great grands, right? Because they have to inherit this, right? And I'm praying that what they inherit is what we have done to change the dynamics of the social order, right? I hope that's what they inherit, right? That's what they inherit the people's senate. Right? Well, we as a people are organized in our best benefit for ourselves and begin to depend on ourselves in a communal way. Imagine that. We tell these people, oh, look, you, look. huh? Tell me, take a hike. All right? We're going to organize our communities. We're going to organize ourselves. We're going to build the kind of systems that we need to survive. In the movement, uh, the Black Panther Party had a, a program called uh, Survival Pending Revolution. All right? Survival Pending Revolution. I got a problem with that, that idea, that narrative. So we changed it. All right? We call it building decolonization programs. Decolonization programs. Why? Because we need to decolonize our thinking and ensure that our survival is based on building the revolution, not pending. We survive by building the revolution, by creating alternative systems of governing, of survival, of living. That's how we survive. All right? We got to stop being dependent on them, start being dependent on ourselves. That's the reality. Any more questions? Yes, sis. I'll just try. I did see your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Uh, first, I want to say thank you. It's a blessing to share space with you. All of our elders are a blessing. Um, so, as an abolitionist, I believe that political prisoners are the compass of our struggle. So, I'm wondering if you could please share more with everyone here about why it's so important to build relationships and mutual aid with our comrades on the inside and a practical step anyone can take you know, in this room today that start doing that. Thank you. Excellent, excellent question. One that um, I need to kick myself in the booty for failing to talk about earlier. All right. Yeah, we need to support political prisoners. The National Jericho Movement is one of the organizations that's very much in support of uh, building and recognizing political prisoners. We have individuals in prison that should not be there. Like Al Haas Malik Shabbat, uh, excuse me, please. Like Iman Jamil al -Amin. All right? Formerly known as Rat Brown. The free rap, that's right. All right, Rap Brown used to be a member of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, back in the '60s. They created a law behind him, right? I think it was in uh, Ohio or Indiana, somewhere. He made a presentation, he made a speech at a university. When he left, the people rioted. Right? He was gone. He's in another state. People rioted. They charged him. They tried to charge him with inciting. Okay, and they created a law called the Rat Brown Law. That like any time that a person make a presentation and the people respond to that in a way that is against the order of the social order, that they can be charged with that. Rat Brown Law. Right? He joined the underground. He eventually got captured. I think he did something like 20 years. I don't know if he did that long. Right? But he did uh, a period of time in prison. He got out, became the imam of the statue of community uh, in Atlanta. And right before the uh, beginning of the Iraq War, right, 
uh, they wouldn't set him up. Okay. There was, at that time, there was five major imams uh, or leaders, Muslim leaders in, in this country. And they had a, rotate, a system of rotating who was going to be the national imam uh, during that session. His time was coming up, okay, as one of the five. And they wouldn't set him up, lock him up, and put him in prison. Because they knew that he would not support, you know, he would speak out, and he would organize people to speak out against the Iraqi war. All right? And they said he killed a police officer. How do we know he did not do it? Because somebody else confessed. The person who committed it confessed. And he meets the description of the person who he was looking for. Right? What he said, respectability and the COINTEL pro, before the engaged in violence, right? they didn't kill him, but they tried to. Right? They put him in prison. He has to be released. Kamal Siddiqui. Veteran member of the Black Panther Party, veteran member of the Black Liberation Army. Did time, got out, started establishing his family and his community, reestablished himself in this community. The FBI came to him and said, listen, we want you to set up Osama Shakur so we can capture her. Mm -hmm. All right? Why did they choose him? Because he is the father of Osama Shakur's daughter, Kikuya. All right? He refused. He said, I'm not doing that. All right? He's back in prison. Set him up. Right? Innocent of the charge. Okay. Veronza Bars just got out May 7th. About Veronza. Veronza, former member, a veteran member of the Black Panther Party, Black Liberation Army. Right? Was paroled on his way out the front door, leaving, escorted by the superintendent. Anthony Gonzalez, who was the Attorney General of the United States at the time, called the prison and told him, don't let him go. Don't let him out. They're afraid he's going to come out and do what I'm doing. <laughs> I come out here and talk about the issues and organize. Okay, I got lucky, and I'll talk about that if you care to know. All right? Um, but he just got out in May, almost 20 years after he was rigid, was granted parole. Okay. We have many others. Inside, we had Linda Paltier, right? Sue, right? Wounded knee. They know he did not commit the trial. He commit the murder of these FBI agents, right? Because he was a representative of a leader in the AIM, uh, American uh, Indian Movement, right? They locked him down, okay? And there's many, many others. Go to the Jericho Movement, right? Now, Jericho Movement, go to the website. Read about our political prisoners, right? Support them, right? If you just can send them a, a commissary, five dollars, two dollars, twenty dollars, right, in the mail, do that, right? Write them a letter, do that. If they got the campaign, you know the campaign, support their campaign, right? Let's build the base of foundations where we can get our people out. We can demand their release. Okay. Free them all. Yeah. Free them all. What's the call? Free them all. What's the call? Free them all. That's what we're going to do. We have to, right? They do represent the best of us because they did, in fact, put their life and their liberty on the line for our common humanity. Right? Any more questions? Yes, bro. I can't hear you. Peace be the law, please. Um, I'm with the League of Class Conscious Workers in the Bay Area. Okay. And we study a lot of the works of uh, Comrade Harry Haywood on the black national question and how to organize workers mm -hmm. um, and balance the class struggle and national struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and we see like, our strategy as organizing the multinational working class at their points of production mm -hmm. in order to uh, uh, seize power as the best strategy for achieving self-determination, mm -hmm. um, both within the Black Belt and for the entire Black nation around the country. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that strategy and that question of the most effective tactics and strategies for us achieving self-determination? Gotcha. Excellent question. Thank you for the question. Uh, 1968, uh, in Detroit, Michigan, there were 500 revolutionary nationalists, black revolutionary nationalists came together, right, to organize together 
uh, to consider what is our golden objectives, right? And at that time, they, they met at a church, uh, Reverend Franklin Church. Uh, Reverend Franklin is the father of a known singer, right, Aretha Franklin. Right. Reverend Franklin was a Garveyite. He supported the ideals of Marcus Garvey. And during the course of that, that uh, conference um, that they had, they were attacked uh, by the cops. Okay. One of the individuals was there uh, by the name of uh, Mutulu Shakur, 15 years old. Dr. Mutulu Shakur just recently passed Presente. Right, uh, who started the brilliant uh, black acupuncture organizing uh, 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 a development that helped uh, uh, deal with the issues of addiction using acupuncture. Right, they now use it today. His practice, and um, which, which, well, let me let me finish the question. And Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. King, you, can, you know, we can talk talk about the issues. Uh, and so at that '68. Uh, they organized what they call the Provisional Government of New Africa, right? The Provisional Government of New Africa is recognizing that the Black Belt uh, South, uh, particularly South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana, are the traditional uh, homeland of black people in this country, African people in this country. And we we're working towards uh, organizing to liberate this territory, right? As I talked about the, uh, the autonomous, uh, nation that was being built uh, during, after the Emancipation Proclamation, right? So we're going to do that again. And there are people now organizing in the Black Belt South today, OK? Uh, Jackson, uh, um, what is it called? Uh, Liberation. Liberation Jackson. Yeah, Corporation Jackson right, is one. And there's many others that's being organized down, down in the South. And there are people now, black people, returning back to the South. So they say they can't make it in the East and the West. Right, uh, because of the systems of, of oppression. Right? And so for us, it, it's important that we come to that conclusion, that understanding. Now, as many black people do not recognize, do not identify themselves as being New Africans. Okay. Uh, again, that's an issue within the eternal struggle of black people. Right? And we will resolve that. I identify myself as New African. I, I recognize the fact that we need to build our own nation. Right? We need to divorce ourselves from these systems of uh, capitalist imperialism and, uh, 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 and racial uh, suppression and oppression, all right? Uh, that's right, free to land, okay? So that's the goal. Uh, uh, Brother um, uh, Howard, uh, his ideas is correct for the most part, right? The methodology, the means of how we implement that and, and, and put it together, we're still working towards that. What I call, I'm organizing what I call Foley Now, Front for Liberation of the African Nation. If you read the book, you'll find the whole dynamics in here, right? We need to build the front, right? The People Senate is also a national front, but it's all of us, okay? And it's important that we build the People Senate because the People Senate will be the buffer for the new nation, for the black nation. And we need that buffer, right? Very similar to how the Yankees was the buffer for the, 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 the beginning of the autonomous regions uh, of African uh, uh, governing, right? We're going to need a new buffer as well. I'm going to put this out front, right? And it's going to depend upon others, right? Liberated, socialist, uh, creating a buffer around the new nation against the, the, the white supremacists. Right, so they ain't going away. Okay, they're not. Right? They have to be curtailed. Right, from their practices of white supremacy. Right, and the only way we can do that, we have to alienate them. Right, isolate them. Okay, I don't care about the white people who want to be white. Supremacy. You want to be white supremacy? Be white all the white supremacy you want to be. Right, go to wherever you want to go and be the white supremacy you want to be. Okay. But when you try to impose that upon me, we got a problem. Okay, if you believe you're superior to any other people on the planet, more power to you. Okay, but you try to impose that upon me, we got a problem. Okay, so I'm not gonna try to stop you from being a white supremacist. 
I'm going to stop you from being a white supremacist imposing those ideas on me. That's what I'm going to stop. Okay. So for us, it is, uh, it's imperative that we recognize that we can, that international law, Declaration of Human Rights, right, informs us, and there's a lot more I can talk about. It. It's in the book, the laws that supports uh, uh, the wars for decolonization, right? So we're going to build forward on the front for the liberation of the African nation, right, a national front, uh, for the purpose of extending the idea towards nationhood, right? And as we build nationhood for us, the other sovereigns will also build nationhood for themselves, right? The other indigenous communities, right? Know that this country, I'm going to say this out loud as well, this country needs to be balkanized, right? What they did in Yugoslavia, or it was once was Yugoslavia, right? We need to balkanize this country. We need to tear this country apart. And I say openly and deliberately, purposefully, intentionally. That's the only way we're going to survive it. All right? Uh, and I'm asking white people, right? If you believe in socialism, then build a socialism. Build a socialist America. Okay? I, I support that. Okay? Because that ultimately would result in my, our being our own, building our own nation as well. And create our own sovereignty, right? That is the revolution. Revolution. Our struggle is the resolutions of contradictions. All right? Revolutions is the resolutions of contradictions. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to resolve contradictions that we have in our social order. All right? And it's not easy, it's difficult, it is hard, because many people have been calcified in their thinking. That's why we develop our, what we call decolonization programs, because we have decolonized our minds, decolonized our thinking. All right? You will not be free if you don't think free. All right? And they try to continue to make sure that you think like a slave and act like a slave, dependent upon them. Okay. And then they'll dictate how you'll be resourced, if you'll be resourced. Right. So for us to the demand, as hopefully what was going to be the demand of, um, of um, uh, Sean Fain, right, when he called for this strike in, two, in two, 2028, about three more years, right, one of them will be that we can take control of the means of production. To put it back in the workers' control, the workers' hands, all right, instead of these bosses who are reaping each over the profits from our labor. All right. That should be the thinking. That should be a, we have to reimagine what it looks like, what the government will look like, what our government will look like, how will we govern ourselves. We have to reimagine that. Just as they imagine what they created, we have to deconstruct that and create something new, new and improved. All right? Okay. What well, I said, revolutionary. New revolutionary tide. Well, get your clothes cleaner than that old red tide. Oh, well, okay. I mean, how they put the commercial. They're revolutionizing everything. All right? We're going to do a real revolution. Real revolution in our minds. All right? Thought precedes action. Is that correct? How you think is the determining factor of what you do. Is that right? So we got to change our thinking. So we've been indoctrinated into a system of being slaves. Consciously or unconsciously. Right? I had a saying I did on this podcast one time, right? Free your mind and your, your ass will follow. Your ass will follow. <laughs> we gotta free our minds. Okay, any more questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Good question. 
intercommunalism. This is a theory that was put together from uh, Hugh P. Newton. I believe it was this book, uh, Revolutionary Suicide, or To Die for the People. I can't remember which one it was, right? Well, in the book, he talked about intercommunalism. Intercommunalism is, is essentially an African term or African way of organizing the community, almost like federations. The Sioux, I mean, not the food, uh, uh, um, uh, the Mohawk, was it Mohawk? I think it was Mohawk, right? Had the Mohawk Federation, right? It was intercommunal, right? Where you have various nations or various tribes uh, within the, the federation or within the, and they commune with one another. They trade and barter almost, right, in many instances. Right. It is a way to return back to the origins of how we create social order, intercommunalism, something called communism. Right. Uh, communism is the absence. See, we have, communism is the absence of government. Right. And I don't think that's. Uh, we don't have a true communist country nowhere on this planet. Okay. They, someone they name themselves and identify themselves as communist, but they're not truly communist. Right. right. So intercommunalism is the way we commune. It's the way that we trade and barter with one another, right? In social d dynamics, uh, economic dynamics, right? It's intercommunalism, uh, and it's both for uh, inside internally, but also international, right? Uh, where you have the kind of relationship with uh, other nations based upon what you're able to provide and what you actually need uh, from those other nations. Okay. Uh, and that's basically the, the founding foundation of intercommunalism, right? Both on a national and international level, right? And yes, we need to consider that, broaden the idea of intercommunalism, right? And, uh, and essentially build it and manifest it. Because that's the way we challenge the system of capitalism, uh, right? the idea of individualism and competition, right? Where we recognize that we are in, in this together, right? They're destroying the planet. That's the set way. We need to destroy the planet. Climate, climate change. You see what's just happening with, in, uh, where is that, uh, Texas, somewhere? All right, these se se severe storms, all right? They're destroying the planet. I don't know what this planet's going to look like in the next 25 years, the next 50 years, right? whether it be habitable, right? And if it's not habitable, you know what's going to happen, right? Uh, Elon Musk and his crew, they're going to go to Mars. <laughs> They're preparing for it. They're preparing for it. And we're silent. We're quiet. You know, we're watching it as we're watching this genocide that's going on in Gaza. Right. Cognitive dissonance. Did I, did I talk about that? Oh, I'm going to talk about that. I didn't get to it. All right, this is an experience that I've had. All right, in a cell. Did I say it? Did I talk about it? I did. Okay, all right. See, I know the story. Yeah, I know the story. Okay. Sometimes I get confused, I got so much to say. All right. But yeah, we, we suffer cognitive dissonance in it. You know? We see it, we know it's wrong, and yet we, it's like we don't see it. All right? It does not register. All right? Not only does it does not register, we don't even believe that we can do anything about it. All right? we, 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 the degree of apathy all right? it has been instilled. And, and not only that, but the, in the struggle itself, right? we bring those that, that indoctrination into the movement, right? Like competition and individualism, right? And it hurts us, it harms us. That's why we need to go through this process of decolonizing our thinking and decolonizing our minds. Because we seem to bring that baggage, that baggage into, that negative baggage into the struggle. So it's a process of relearning our relationship to one another, right? It's a process. Che Guevara said, revolutions are motivated by a strong sense of love. Of love. If you don't love yourself, and Hal Hodge and Malik Shabazz pointed out, why do you hate yourself? If you don't love yourself, right, how are you gonna love anybody else? Okay. We have to gender engender love amongst us. Che said that he could not believe a revolutionary being absent of love. For the people. Okay, I'm a revolutionary. I love humanity. I love people. I do. I put my life on the line. All right? Eric Farm, a book named by Eric Farm, right? Um, I can't remember the name of the book, but there's one 
sentence in there that stuck with me ever since. It says, you labor for that which you love, you love for that which you labor. All right? Just as a mother goes through nine months of labor to produce that child, right? She does it out of love, okay? We have to engage, we have to labor in this struggle. And we have to do so with that pride sense of love of self and our people. Right? And that's what will allow you to commit to the sacrifice. Be willing to commit to sacrifice. A mom's gonna sacrifice for her babies. Right? She will allow herself to die to show her baby lives. Right? That kind of love. Many of them, not say all of them, you know, but many, majority. Right? And that's what we have to be. And our understanding of each other and the work that we need to do. You have to be prepared to do sacrifice. Okay. So yeah, inner communalism, bro. It's 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 a new system. And hopefully uh, the people sent it will be able to incorporate the ideas of inner communalism as we grow and evolve. No more questions? Yes, my brother. Thank you, bro. Uh, I okay. Um, All right. Good. Glad for you. It's a question. It's a question slash advice. Um, so during the time on um, my brother Earl. Uh huh. So I've been knowing my brother Earl since the second grade. Like we was co-defendants first, okay. time together, sellies, everything. Yeah. I went on to do more time. But um, come to find out that he's a Trump supporter. He said what? Trump supporter. He's a Trump supporter? Okay, okay, Trump supporter. Oh, All right. I believe that Trump is a racist and a white supremacist, right? Mm, mm, mm. So when we converse time, it's time, you know, I, I don't do the back and forth, mm. right? But he defends them here on all these subjects. Have you ever, do you entertain these conversations? And if you have, mm -hmm. How do you respond? I mean, okay. outside of your Muslim brothers, because I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Ain't none of them support. Okay. That's funny. Trump. <laughs> 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 Who's going to Trump Trump? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, we have conversations like you get to speak the truth. Truth to power. Right? He's a lie. All right. And so we have to expose the lie, all right, the deception. Okay. And in doing so, we do this. Say, hey, he's a white supremacist. All right? He's not supporting black people, brown people, indigenous people. Okay. And if they don't understand that, then they're the enemy. So we have to be very cut and clear about the understanding of what we're dealing with here. All right? We're going to have family members who's going to be on the other side. OK? And we have to treat them that way. It's going to be harsh. It's going to be difficult. OK? If they cannot decolonize their thinking, right, and they support the system that exploit their own people, like you see these black cops, right? that will kill you just as quick as the white cops will kill you because of their mentality where they're thinking, right? That their blue is better than, or greater than their black or their brown or the indigenous, right? Uh, then they have to be dealt with, okay? In no uncertain terms. All right, so I say things based upon my own personal experience. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, recognizing that I've had people, I know people, who had to be eliminated, right? Because they betrayed the movement. Right? They betrayed, they went to the other side and put other people's lives in sacrifice, right? In danger, in jeopardy. Okay. People that was close to me. 
Right. Uh, we had a case, I'm going to tell you about the San Francisco 8 case, right, very briefly, right? That betrayed the movement, betrayed us, okay? Uh, if you ever got an opportunity to go to Legacy of Torture, go to YouTube, Legacy of Torture, all right? They torture people here in this country, all right? You saw what happened in Abu Ghraib, they've been doing that for years here, right? The lynching is just an example, 100 years of lynching, an example of what they do. But we had a comrade, he was tortured, I mean, severely tortured, and he flipped, all right? In the San Francisco 8 case. And so it came time to, let me just, just say something about it. It was eight of us, two of us are still in prison, myself and Herman Bell were still in prison. The other uh, seven or other uh, six were out uh, in the community doing their work and living their families. This is a 30 year old case, a cold case. Right? And they decided they're going to come get us to solve this case in San Francisco. Okay, it was after, again, it was the issue, it was after uh, the assassination of, uh, uh, of uh, George Jackson, Comrade George Jackson, right? And so 30 years later, they crowd all of us, brought us back to San Francisco, right, and started to prosecute us. And, uh, and part of the, their, their, their uh, evidence, the prosecutors, the statements made by this one individual, right? under duress, okay. When it came part to the preliminary hearings, because they had told, listen, Kamala Harris was the, was the DA in San Francisco at the time of the trial. Yeah, yeah. But she refused to prosecute. They brought the case to the uh, a federal government uh, to prosecute the case. They refused to prosecute. Then they brought the case to the Attorney General of California, California State Attorney General, and he decided to prosecute the case. And they told them they had a weapon, recovered a weapon that was used in this particular incident. They said they had DNA evidence to be used in this, death, in this evidence. And they also said that they had a star witness to be used in this evidence. And that's how they got the case, got the indictment. Okay, go to preliminary hearing, time to start the trial. Guess what happened? They can't find the gun, right? The DA, uh, the D DNA evidence disappeared, right? And the star witness, <clears throat> the attorney general asked the, the officers, the detectives that brought the case, would the, um, would the uh, uh, witness testify, because we told the judge that this guy had been tortured. All right. He didn't want to believe it. The judge didn't want to believe it, so we brought the tape. We gave it to the judge. And DA was oh, he was furious. Right? But our attorneys was sagacious enough to slide it to the judge. Okay. So the attorney general went to the star witness and asked the star witness, said, listen, um, were you tortured? He said, yeah. He said, if I put you on the stand and testify, will you say that you was tortured? He said, if the defense asked me if I was tortured, I would tell them I was tortured. Hmm? No case. They closed the case down. Okay. So I just tell that story just to, only to inform you that um, we have people who's going to betray the movement. We have people who's going to side with the other side. Right? Uh, there are going to be people that are going to be paid to give privileges to side with the other side. Okay? And when you find those individuals, find that situation, you have to ostracize. You have to cut them off, right? They have joined the camp of the enemy, all right, either consciously or unconsciously. And so those who support Trump, as an example, right, you know what side they're on. They are not on the side of liberation, and independence, and sovereignty of our people. They're not, because he's not, okay? So if he supports Trump, then ask him, does he support colonization? Does he support Zionism? Does he support genocides? Does he support the, uh, the impoverishment of our communities? Right? Because Trump is not going to do anything better to improve those conditions. He's going to make them worse. Right? He wants to be a dictator. He said that. 
Okay. And so if your brother, whoever the case may be, family member, believes in dictatorship, then I tell him to say, uh, he's more power to him, right? And uh, he, he got problems. Because the people do not believe in that. Okay. Hey, uh, Mr. King, you want to share something with us? I'm doing wonderful, bro. Minister King is one of our representatives in, in here in California. Uh, he has a, a organization, a movement, developing in support of uh, support of our comrades who was in, inside prison, who have mostly have been on the hunger strike, the Pelican hun hunger strike. Minister King. Support, support Minister King, support Minister King, support the People's Program. Uh, uh, it is very important that we get organized and create structures of liberation, straight structures of emancipation, straight structures of abolition. All right? Those are three things that we have to do. We have to become liberators, we have to become emancipators, and we have to become abolitionists. All right? Identify yourselves in those capacities, and let's build to win. We don't build to lose, we build to win. Asala Shakur says, we have a duty to fight, we have a duty to win. Thanks, hey, brother. I love you, my brother. All right, yeah, first, uh, B, you can turn that one down too. Yeah, this is great. Okay. Uh, you know, first, I want to thank God for allowing us to be here. Second, I want to thank y'all the community for showing up and supporting uh, people's programs, Jericho Movement, Spirit of Mandela. Uh, and lastly, I want to I want to thank Jaleel. Yeah, give it up for him. He's a very humble dude, and that's something I admire about him. But it's important that we all recognize we named a lot of people today. A lot of our elders that, you know, some that are locked up behind walls and some that are no longer here. We talked about Huey, we talked about Che, we talked about Bobby, we talked about El Haj and El Shabazz. And it's important to know that he is cut from that same cloth. He has gave us decades of the staunch example of what it means to be a revolutionary and what it means to be committed to the struggle and be committed to the people. There's a chapter or a section in his book where he talks about commitment is key. Uh, and I encourage y'all to. To, to read that section and you'll see that he's the walking embodiment of it. Uh, I think we talk a lot about standing on the shoulders of our, of our elders, uh, and this is what it means to put that into practice, to come here to build with them, to build real programs, not to just take the words that they say uh, haphazardly, but to really embody it and put it to work. Uh, so I encourage y'all to buy merch, buy a poster, buy a book, buy a pen, uh, and if you already bought it, buy some more, donate some more, because what he's been doing this whole time uh, not just this, not just this past week, but what he's dedicated since he's come home in 2018. 2020. 
2020, since he's been home, uh, he's been putting feet to the pavement, put, putting work together for to bring the rest of his comrades home. And so anything he's doing today is supporting uh, political prisoners and prisoners of war. And so, uh, you know, I encourage you all again to go back there and, and, uh, and buy some stuff. And if you don't want to buy nothing, you just make a donation. But uh, free the people. Free the people. Free the people. Free the people. Free the land. Free the people. Free the land. Free the land. Tack beer. Come on, tack beer. Oh, Clip wings. With clip wings, I'm laid to the test. Where the weary gets it, no rest. Some use the psychological warfare to learn if I can withstand others who grandstand because they believe their own land. Well, my life is sustained by sleight of hand. No, it's not magic. It's a matter of having a better plan. You ask, what is the plan? Well, it's to know your enemy as you know yourself. Be capable of adjusting to conditions you do not trust. Stay away from those who don't have your best interest at heart and always depart when all else is lost. Get as much education as your brain can stand. Build a strategy even from a grain of sand. Heat applied to sand will make glass to turn your heat up and put your ass to the task. As they say, free your mind and your ass will follow as opposed to a closed mind that is often hollow. Nothing on the brain and time to waste is the place where the devil makes grace. Prepare to feed on your life like your enemy to ensure you stay on the path of strife.